Well, hey, everyone. Uh, like Liz said, my name's Pete Stauffer. I'm the Ocean Protection Manager for Surfrider. Uh, sorry, I can't be there in person. I'm calling in from San Clemente, California, where the national office is. Uh, and that's also the uh, ancestral lands of the Ashiman Nation. So I'm going to give you just a very quick overview of our ocean protection work. Um, there's a few core issues that we work on that we'll go through, but the goal is very simple. It's basically protecting our ocean ecosystems, uh, including all the recreational opportunities they provide. Uh, so we'll walk through uh, offshore drilling, uh, walk through marine protected areas and renewable energy. Uh, and then Gus and Liz are going to present a case study on our seabed mining campaign up in Washington. Uh, next slide. So one of the big issues we work on at the national level is stopping offshore drilling. Uh, this is the extraction of oil or gas from beneath the seafloor. Uh, offshore drilling is terrible for the ocean. It's terrible for communities and the planet whether it's oil pollution or spills or climate change or refineries on land, uh, it's really terrible. And so it's one of our goals is to end drilling uh, in US waters. Uh, we have a national campaign right now, uh, really focused on protecting the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska in the next five year offshore drilling plan. So you all can join that petition uh, for the next few days uh, until we submit those comments. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, offshore drilling isn't as big a threat. Uh, the Northwest was not included in the Biden administration proposal for new drilling. Uh, that said, we are still trying to get permanent protections for the West Coast. And so that's something that we hope to do, uh, if not at the end of this Congress, uh, next Congress. So that will prevent um, you know, any future threat of offshore drilling off the Northwest. Uh, next slide. Another big issue that we work on for ocean protection is marine protected areas. Uh, marine protected areas are places in the ocean that are protected from human impact. And they come in all shapes and sizes. So for example, marine reserves are fully protected. There's no fishing, no extraction. Um, they tend to be smaller, and Oregon, of course, has a system of marine reserves and protected areas in state waters. Uh, but marine protected areas can also be much larger, and they can be multi-use. So an example of that would be the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. So that's off uh, Washington State. Um, that does allow fishing, but includes um, important protections and research and education. Um, the bottom line is if you protect a place in the ocean, the ecosystem will respond. And this is especially true for fully protected reserves. Over time, you're likely to see greater abundance of marine life, uh, greater diversity, greater average size of organisms. Um, so Surfrider has been very active over the past few decades in supporting protected areas in Oregon and Washington. Uh, there's a 10-year review right now for Oregon's Marine Reserve Program, uh, and Charlie's been leading our efforts in that, uh, and should be some good opportunities to help strengthen that program. Uh, and then, of course, in Washington, you have the National Marine Sanctuary, the Olympic Coast. Uh, there are also other protected areas in Puget Sound, uh, and obviously both Gus and Liz are great resources for supporting that work. Next slide. And then the third issue I wanted to quickly highlight is renewable energy. So this would include offshore wind projects, would include wave energy projects, uh, basically harnessing uh, renewable resources to generate electrical power. Uh, this is uh, obviously a big issue right now, not only in the West Coast, but really all around the country, all around the world. Uh, there's tremendous interest. Um, we are seeing larger projects getting proposed. Uh, and for Surfrider, it's a really interesting issue because we're very concerned about climate change. We know that we desperately need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So obviously these renewable energy projects are a way to do that. 
Um, at the same time, some of these projects are massive in scale uh, and could have some really, really significant impacts for our ocean and coastline. So Surfrider has a policy statement on renewable energy. And you can think of it, it it's kind of like best practices uh, in terms of like, here are the things we need to do to make sure that these projects move forward in the right way. So we use that, that policy to, uh, to sort of guide our participation. And a shout out to Charlie and Gus in particular. They've been following this issue very closely. They've been involved in ocean planning uh, work at the state level. Um, and we're, will, we're really well positioned to, uh, to have an important voice and make sure that these projects move forward in the right way uh, and that they benefit uh, local communities. The, uh, the final issue, which I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Gus and Liz, uh, is seabed mining. This is another emerging use of the ocean uh, that's highly concerning. Uh, and we had a huge victory in Washington state last year. So with that, I will turn it over to them and I'll stay on the chat um, if there's questions or comments that come up. Sweet, I'll be fast. Um, so one of the more recent examples of the ocean protection campaign on the ground in the Pacific Northwest was, was it last year? Two years ago, for what is time? Last year, um, we banned seabed mining in Washington state water. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview. Um, so this was, oh, there we go. During last year's legislative session, um, we launched the campaign on October 1st of 2020. And we did a whole bunch of outreach because seabed mining is not a well-known industry yet. It's just getting started. It's been kind of theoretical. We haven't had the technical ability to mine the deep, uh, but that is changing and it's changing quickly. Um, so we wanted to get ahead of this industry in Washington before they got a hold um, and invested. And so um, we were the second state to do this after Oregon, which did it back in the 90s, so go Oregon. And very recently, California just followed suit. So there's no seabed mining in state waters along the entire Pacific coast of the continent of the US, except Alaska. That's very exciting. And sort of what we did as part of this was um, I gave over 20 presentations um, about seabed mining to every single chapter in Washington. So thank you guys for giving me my platform, as well as Sierra Club, Old Broads of the Wilderness, uh, Marine Resource Committees, so uh, classrooms of various kinds, tribal schools, um, just getting it out there so people knew this was a threat um, and knew that it could happen in our waters. Um, there, it was super successful, partly because uh, we worked with Pew. They have a group that, um, we kind of tapped into their network of contacts and sort of shared our network. So we were able to get that outreach out there beyond just like our surf rider network, but using their connections as well. Um, and so we did a very well, a good job of coordinated outreach. Um, we had regular meetings, especially during the legislative session, we were meeting like weekly um, so that we could adapt and pivot as needed. Um, and it was really nice because we didn't have any established industry opposition. Um, and we also had a lot of good um, support from beyond just the environmental community, but fishing community, businesses, et cetera. Um, and it was actually really nice because of the virtual situation. Um, anybody was able to sign in pro remotely and it takes like two seconds. Um, so it was really great to have that sort of civic participation that was very low barrier for people to show their support of our bills. Um, next. Um, did you wanna do lessons learned? Sure. Um, well, Liz kind of, you know, a little, not jump the gun, but uh, gave you the, the, the key takeaways there from the outcome. But I wanted to just add a couple of points of emphasis. Really, this significant coastal victory would not have happened without Surfrider Foundation's leadership. And I want to give a huge shout out to Liz for all of her incredible outreach on this effort. She actually was hired right at the very start of the pandemic, 2020. Uh, you know, Ed and I were like, should we even be having this interview in person kind of thing in, in April? And she came on and leaned into this campaign, really hit it out of the park. Um, and, you know, it's funny, like just kind of the backstory, we were working with a few charitable trusts and, and our partners and they were like, yeah, we really want to do this seabed mining ban, uh, but we're, we can't lobby and, we, you know, we have some major limitations there used our network that we have from uh, our chapter executive committee members, uh, Katie Lazeter, who used to be a Olympia chapter um, leader 
was a very high level uh, aquatics division staffer in the Department of Natural Resources, set up a meeting with her and, and her coworkers, brought in Pew Charitable Trust, and they basically said, look, best pathway forward on this issue is through the legislature. And we predict if you do it, that you'll pass it unanimously. And so Pew heard that and they're like, oh, okay, I guess that sort of makes sense. Uh, and <clears throat> then after that, I was able to use my, my contacts in the network, reached out to Senator Kevin Vandeweg. Uh, it just so happens that another Olympia chapter uh, former leader, Pete Steelquist was his staffer and uh, was, was able to make the pitch to them and say, hey, we've, we've got this campaign on the horizon. Will you be willing to be the, the champion of this legislation? They agreed to it. It passed. Didn't pass unanimously. There was two people who voted against it, uh, but basically unanimously. And you know, as you heard, uh, it set the way for California to then do it and have this entire West Coast block and to then hopefully scale up at the future date and have that important conversation about federal protections in the federal waters as well. So um, just really, you know, uh, you know, it's one of those really heavy policy heavy campaigns, but how we're able to use our network to really have a significant influence in getting that across the finish line. And I'm done. <laughs> Now, can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Everyone's good. I should progress, right? Okay, cool. So thank you. Um, my name's Mara Diaz and I lead our Clean Water Initiative, whose main goal is to protect water quality and reduce pollution so it's safe to surf, swim, and play in the ocean and in our coastal waterways. Next slide. Whether you like to surf, next slide. Paddle, next slide. Dive under the water, next slide. No matter what that perfect day at the beach looks like for you or your family, you shouldn't have to worry about potentially getting sick because you're coming, um, being exposed to pollution. Next slide. Unfortunately, there are a lot of different sources of pollution that we have to deal with. And stormwater and sewage really are those the two big main ones that are responsible for the majority of the swim advisories and beach closures that we experience across the country. And they're related. Many of the sewage failures that we have, whether systems on regular sewers, combined sewers, septic or cesspools, they're related to rain and flooding and, and stormwater. If we'll go to the next slide you can see how when we have pipes like sewer pipes that have been buried you know, under the ground and not maintained properly, there's blockages, there's, there's cre um, creeks, <laughs> there's cracks. When it rains a lot, water gets in there, right? And then there's just too much flow in the pipes and it can't all go to the treatment plant. So you get overflow of untreated sewage out into your local waterways. Next slide. And, and in systems that are on septics or cesspools, they, they function very similarly. Even when they function properly, which is on the left-hand side, yes, the pathogens typically are you know, removed from the flow before it hits groundwater or your surface waters, but a lot of the nutrients and nearly all the nitrogen passes through the soil into the groundwater and then out into your bays and sound where it causes a lot of problems. When it rains a lot, you're also getting, you know, sewage directly into your, into your runoff, into your groundwater, surface waters, and, you know, all the pathogens there. Next slide. 
having sewage in the water that you're swimming or surfing or paddling or diving in is you know, not good for your health. You could potentially get sick or next slide. There's also a lot of, like I showed you with the septic systems, there's a lot of nutrients and particularly nitrogen is problematic in coastal waterways. Too much, too much nutrients causes these harmful algal blooms and even just nuisance algae blooms, which really disrupt healthy ecosystems the water can run out of oxygen, causing fish kills. The water becomes more acidic. Lots of different problems that are related to just having too much nutrients and nitrogen in the water. Next slide. So what are, oh yes, climate change is making this worse, right? Changing weather patterns, warmer water, warmer air temperatures, bigger storms, more rain, it's just causing that interaction between the storm water and the flooding and the wastewater infrastructure even worse so that we're, we're getting more discharges out into our waterways. Next slide. So what is Surfrider doing about this? We've got a three pronged approach here. We wanna ensure there's adequate water quality testing. So we know it's where it's safe to surf and swim in the water. And when we find problems, we wanna build awareness of those in the community so that we can get the support that we need to advocate for solutions uh, to that pollution. Next slide. Leaning on that first prong there, we have been, Surfrider has been advocating to increase the funding for the Beach Act for many, many years. This is the EPA program that provides federal funding out to the coastal states so that they can uh, run their beach water testing programs. This is a priority at Hill Day every year. If you've participated in that, I, I'm hoping the Beach Act sounds very familiar to you. If we go to the next slide, this program funds the beach program run by the Department of Ecology in Washington. You can go to their website to see where they're testing and what their advisories they might have. Next slide. In Oregon, it's the health authority there that and again, they have a great website. They post a lot of good information there. I really encourage you to check out. And if we go to the next slide, we're also working to fill in the gaps of these agency programs with our Blue Water Task Force program. We have a lot of very successful Blue Water Task Force programs in Oregon and Washington that are really filling in the gaps of these programs, testing where the agencies aren't, we're testing when they aren't, you know, in Oregon and Washington and pretty much every other coastal state with few exceptions from September or October through till May, there isn't any sampling being done except for us. And we're out there testing it year round when people are getting into the water. Next slide. And as important as testing this water is making sure you're communicating your results and letting people know about what you're finding. There's a lot of different ways that chapters are sharing the results digital platforms, as well as in-person um, communications. A few examples you'll see here on the next slide. I've got, we've got, I don't know. I think if you click a button, something else will come up. There's an, another part of this slide. Yeah, thanks. The, a lot of chapters are sending out these water quality reports every time they test. This is an example from here on Eastern Long Island. In the new email system that you all be transferring over to, uh, HubSpot, I think it is here soon. There's a template already in there, easy to plug in. So you can get this information out pretty easily in a nice, crisp way. So if you're interested in this, contact your regional staff or Michelle, who I'll introduce you to at the end. Next slide. A lot of our chapters are becoming really savvy. South Sound's doing a really great job at posting uh, content on Facebook and, and different social media taking photos of their samplers and where they're sampling, just generating that interest and awareness of their program as well as their results. Next slide. Before I hand it over to Stena so she can talk more about the South Sound Blue Water Task Force program, just wanna give you a quick little who's who on Surfrider's clean water team. That's me at the top. I lead our, the initiative, which includes you know, all of our campaigns that are related to water quality at the federal, state or local level. And I also oversee our Ocean Friendly Gardens program, which I didn't have a chance to um, mention here today. But if you have any questions on that, send them to me. But Michelle is listening in virtually. 
she runs our Blue Water Task Force program. So she's the first stop for any questions there. And I believe Katie's in the room somewhere. She organizes our Hill Day and she works on our federal clean water policy priorities with me. So thank you. Was that five minutes, five and a half? <laughs> Thanks, Mara. All right, I'm Sina, and I'm the Blue Water Task Force Coordinator for the South Sound chapter that Mara so nicely mentioned. Uh, talked about the beach program, which is a red group. Give them money so they can do all the testing. Uh, for us, they just do that through Memorial Day to Labor Day. But we know people play in the sound year round. Uh, so uh, that's where we have the opportunity to come in. But um, if they have high things, uh, high results, right? They post signs, they let people know that the beach is not safe to play in. So lots of communication there uh, with that program. So next slide. Do I have slide control? I have slide control. Okay, great. Oops. Um, so yes, what about that testing in the winter months? Because people like to play. Uh, we're trying out the word collaborative science uh, in place of community science. Uh, which is in place of citizen science. So this is try it out as a new inclusive way uh, to think about the partnership that comes together to make good work happen. So we work with uh, Harbor Wild Watch, which is kind of my full-time job hat. So, uh, and the Science and Math Institute, which is a local high school to uh, make our snowboarding happen. I said, I guess local public, a local public high school. And yes, a public high school, thanks Marty. Um, and so we have a fabulous team of volunteers. They go out in these wintertime months to collect a monthly sample. And uh, cheers to Ronell, who has helped develop some incredible signage. If you wanna talk about that, uh, we'll talk more later. So, uh, but let's people know, hey, we're out here and we're sampling. And here's where you can look at the results. Uh, so we go get our samples, they get sent to the lab. We have students, which is really exciting, uh, who are helping analyze those samples and processing all of that. Uh, yeah. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, also, the connection with the teachers there. Uh, he's able to look at that the day after. Uh, next slide, we'll click into a result thing. Um, and so we can see if our bacteria samples are high or not, uh, next slide again. Um, and when those things light up, which uh, was last year, there's definitely a sewage still happening in the Fox waterway. Uh, it's not good when you see lots of Christmas lights. So go ahead, next slide. Um, so when we get high results like this, um, well, I guess any results we get, we will share, we'll upload them onto the Blue Water Task Force website. So you can see the map. Green is low, yellow is medium, red is high. Uh, when we get those high results, we'll, next slide, go and sample whatever sites are high, uh, as well as contact the health department. And so we have, I have the email there and we have a nice little flow chart of like, it's high, go sample again, it's high again. Then they like engage their team into figuring out the mystery of why there's high bacteria and it's not safe to play in the water. So next slide, we talk to them and then they kind of engage that alert network as well. Uh, and so really, it's a great volunteer collaborative effort with all these um, people and organizations to make clean water, or at least to document <laughs> the status of the water. It's not always clean, uh, but that's why we do what we do. So thanks to all the fabulous people who make it happen. And I think that's it. Well, Jen's coming up here. Um, the value of a lot of these programs is that they organically lead to campaigns. So if you start seeing lots of high hits, maybe there's a campaign there to deal with like dog waste or deal with a stormwater runoff, like a specific point source issue or help, you know, improve wastewater treatment facilities practice. So and with that, I'll give it over to Jen. Thanks. Okay. Hi, Jennifer Hi. Savage. Like I said, uh, Plastic Pollution Initiative. Yeah, I have, I do this thing where I always drink way too much coffee before I have to present. And then I'm like, why did I do that again? Now I'm cracked out on coffee. Okay, so I'm gonna 
forget everything. I mean, not forgetting, I'm scrapping what I was going to do because I had this other idea, but it will involve some participation. So it's a perfect opportunity. Is everything okay? And the people on Zoom can see the whole wide space, right? Yeah, they see the discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure. Um, so the plastic solution, well, first, just very quickly, I have been involved with Surfrider for about 15 years, no, 14 years. Uh, I've been on staff for seven. I have been in this particular role just for about six months. Before that, I was California policy manager for seven, six years. And then before that, I chaired the Humboldt County chapter. So I live down in Humboldt County on the Northern California coast. So a little Pacific Northwest flavor um, and super stoked to be here. So the initiative has a program side and a policy side. And the way those two things work together is really, really critical to our success. So do I advance the slide? Sorry. Okay. I'm going to skip to that. Um, so our strategic plan goal is to eliminate single-use plastic products so that they don't get into the ocean anymore by 2035. And so what I thought I would do is a participatory exercise, so to speak, about how our program side and our policy side work together. So the programmatic side consists of the beach cleanups and ocean-friendly restaurants, which we are looking to expand into ocean-friendly everything. So we're looking at bringing in other types of businesses, other types of industries into this ocean-friendly program. And right now we're hiring someone to do that job. We also have um, Jenny Hart, who is our Healthy Beaches Program Manager, probably some of you, many of you hopefully, have interacted with her for beach cleanups and coastal cleanup days. And then on the policy side, we have Miho Lagar, and she helps run different things in different states and offers a lot of support on the ground in that way. And then I try to fill in all the, the gaps that exist. So I will need volunteers. Luckily, there's enough staff here that I can just make them do it if people don't want to stand up. But is anybody, is anybody really passionate about beach cleanups? Okay, come on up. No, no, no. This is going to be very simple. Okay, so you can you start here. Okay. Okay, and then who do we have? Like a policy person? Somebody excited about policy? Would love to go testify in public comment. Somebody's pointing at Rob. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So come stand here. Okay. Okay. So you guys are going to stand next to each other. Each of you take this. Now you can like just hold it tight. You can't let go. Okay. And you have to stand together. Sorry, I don't mean to push you around. No, Can they? Oh, okay. All right, there we go. But I can't, you can't totally face the camera. Oh, okay. This is so surf rider. Guys, we have to be organized. Okay. okay. All right. So, like, right, this will be good. Okay. Preemptive This is in the frame. Right, you're Wonderful. Yes. So, um, so what we're trying to do is get from here to here. So, you know, most people get involved with Surfrider because thank you, Lisa, for um because they come to a beach cleanup. Like that's most people's discussion. So, program side, take a step forward. Okay. Good. Now, notice you cannot. You gotta. You gotta like work in parallel here. And then people get excited about, you know, like, why is all this trash? We gotta stop this. And they start going to city council meetings. That's a policy thing. So take a step forward. Okay. Now I need uh I need another volunteer. Okay, come on up. You can join the program right side. Now there's more beach cleanups and, and there's more like data collection, you're getting actual information. So program people take a step forward. Okay. And then when there's more and more of this information, it makes it easier to pass policy, right? So like you go to your city council and you need a policy person. You need a volunteer? Okay, thank you. That's over time, wasn't that it? Okay, so stand like right there. Okay, now the policy side gets to take a step forward. So you're like passing local ordinances. It's awesome. Who cares about this in front of us? Okay. Come join the program side. All right, we're getting ocean friendly restaurants established. This is awesome. Program side, take a step forward. Perfect. 
Okay, and with all these like local ordinances and the uh, ocean friendly restaurants, like there's a bunch of more media attention. So take like half a second. Okay. Which we can't, you can't leave the policy yeah, side behind yeah, it. We gotta have policy to make lasting change. So, all right, we need a maybe a couple other people. Who wants to be on policy? Okay, here. Huh. <laughs> 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 Because, because like now there's like even more participation, right? There's more, there's more people showing up to the beach cleanups, which means more data is being collected. So take a step forward. Take a half a step for more media attention. Okay. You're gonna have the, the goalpost is shifting. Okay. So then, uh, is there anybody? The Zoom people can't hear me. I'm so sorry, Zoom people. Okay, so who who else just cares about anything? <laughs> if you care, if you nobody nobody has to get up. I'm not pressuring anyone to get up, but if you would like to get up, and you care about you know plastic waste in the ocean, then please come feel please come join come join our movement. Okay, so at this point. Now we've got like so many people participating. So take another step forward. We've got surf ride, not, no, this is, this is a program, well, yeah, program side. We have a lot more people participating. We've got more surf rider chapters, more surf rider chapters are doing things. So take another big step forward. All right. And then because so many people are doing things like state electeds and federal electeds, they're like, whoa, who is this surf rider organization? All these people are driving me crazy, but they're, they're in the news all the time. They're always cleaning up the beach and they're showing up at all, all these meetings. So you get to meet with your state and federal electeds. So take a step forward. Okay. So now here we are. We have surf rider chapters everywhere. We've got all these local ordinances uh, tackling like polystyrene and single use bags and all these different things. And we've got all these, you know, like victories across many different states um, in many different ways. So we're so, so close. We're not quite there yet though. We still have to pass federal legislation. So this is where we are right now. Thank you for your participation. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. <laughs> okay, I didn't I didn't track my time. I'm so sorry. I'm done. Wrap it up. Okay. Thank you very much. I will be here all day. Ask me all your questions. My slide. Oh, yeah. oh, I have to do it myself. No one lets me do this. I don't even understand. <laughs> okay, another. Um, I barfed more photos onto a page for you. Okay, so um, plastic pollution. So uh, I. I do think it has helped that I was a former teacher for 17 years and I um, was already involved in um, environmental education. And so that has really given me like a, a way in to the public school system. So just a couple of these pictures are um, my old colleagues always let me come in and teach stuff. So I have created back in, in 2017 uh, actually, right before I joined Surfrider, I, I created a whole slideshow, kind of one hour presentation uh, called um, Rise Above Plastics, which is all surf, but Rise Above Plastics, it's Surfrider's thing. Um, I think it was Strawless Olympia when I started, but as soon as I joined Surfrider, I was like, yes, I've got this whole organization behind me. So I changed it to Rise Above Plastics. And now I go into classrooms. I've been in um, as low as a second, third grade, which was super fun. And they know a lot. Uh, also invited to high schools to give the presentation. And then one of the cool things um, in our community, there, uh, there are programs who do water quality testing with teachers. So they train us to then do water quality testing with students. 
just obviously because we've already heard that there's not a lot, a, a Department of Ecology can't be everywhere. So the students actually put on goggles and do this chemical testing on site. And so I was involved with that for over 15 years. And at the end of that school year, there is called a Green Congress. And all of the students in the area get to come to an environmental conference where they get to share their water quality data. But there is also an opportunity for them to take classes in all sorts of environmental information. And so I've been there since 27. Well, before that, I was there as a teacher. But when I joined Surfrider, I moved to being a class that students could take on plastic pollution education. So that's that one. And it's really cool because there's 500 students that go to that. So wearing my Surfrider shirt around and being having that as my I don't know what that saying. I forgot the saying. Anyway, it's cool. Then being invited into community uh, organizations. This is the Wet Science Center in downtown Olympia. So getting to do it there. And then that's more community. Uh, there was a Girl Scout troop there though. So that was super cool. And um, and then of course, this is the doing the two funny little TV shows, which was also sharing about plastic pollution. And the cigarette butts, and why I brought this up, because my brain is like a sieve and I don't remember things. Um, this one, was, it was called Mission Nonprofit, and this was called Just Kidding Around, which isn't, plastic pollution isn't funny at all. So that, that maybe that's why it was such a strange show. <laughs> and, then, um, and then our cigarette butt cleanups that we do, and we really are trying to educate, just it's so surprising these days that so many people still don't know that the filter is plastic fibers. And so we really work a lot on that and that's become really popular. Our, our, because I'm blue, I almost cried at our last downtown Olympia cleanup because we had 24 people all ages come to that cleanup. It just, it was so cool. So the city uh, of Olympia has six of our cigarette butt canisters so there is that connection with the downtown. And then, um, oh, so that's what I was gonna tell you. Uh, since 2019, we have picked up 91,000 cigarette butts from the downtown, downtown streets of Olympia. It's actually something that we really, I keep thinking we're gonna change this program in a way to just be more data-driven that can be used for something, I guess I need a little bit of help with that because I'm too lofty. But I mean, obviously it's not cool that every month we do this cleanup and every month we get anywhere from 3,000 to 7,000 bucks at a time in one hour. So, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous on the same streets. Anyway, it's making me all red and hot just thinking about it. <laughs> and then the last uh, really cool thing, I'm almost done was the Sustainability in the Prisons Project. And if you want to hear a little bit about that, I'll tell you at lunch. It was a little sad, though, to tell them about plastic pollution and then they're trapped in prison and couldn't do anything about it. But it was still great talking to So Staley um, was not able to present live today, so she recorded, um, she's our senior legal associate. Uh, she's helped us out tremendously um, here in Washington and Oregon on all of our beach access issues, especially because um, they're pretty complex legal issues typically. Um, so she's gonna talk about our beach access campaign, our initiative, we're doing that. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Staley Prom. I'm Surfrider's Senior Legal Associate, and I hope you're having a great conference. I'm here to present on Surfrider's Beach Access Initiative and how that's playing out in your region. Surfrider's mission is the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean waves and beaches for all people through a powerful activist network. Therefore, getting to the beach is critical to carry out Surfrider's mission through stewardship and recreation. Our beach access initiative works to secure full and fair, low impact beach access for all to enjoy. And there are many aspects of beach access from ensuring people have opportunities to reach the coast, including transportation and added 
put affordable parking, ensuring we have beaches to access, a shoreline armoring and sea level rise can result in coastal squeeze that threatens the very existence of our beaches. And additionally, protecting and restoring access if beachfront property owners block off access, whether perpendicular access to the beach or lateral access along the shoreline. Today, I'm going to give a brief overview of the legal landscape of beach access in Oregon and Washington. However, the question of whether the public has rights at particular locations is often complex and depends on a lot of circumstances. I'll also give a brief example of a beach access campaign in each state. So starting with Oregon, Oregon has some of the strongest beach access protections in the US. The public trust doctrine provides a right of access seaward of the ordinary high tide line to the state owned foreshore or tide lands. And the public can also access the sandy beaches above the ordinary high water line up to the line of vegetation pursuant to Oregon's 1967 beach bill. The beach bill was challenged in court, but it's been upheld by state and federal courts based on the doctrine of custom. In 1969, the Oregon Supreme Court held that the general public had used the dry sand beach as a recreational adjunct of the foreshore since the beginning of the state's political history. And even as long as um, the property had been occupied or inhabited, and therefore under the legal doctrine of custom, they have a right to continue to do so. The court held that the doctrine of custom applies to the sandy beaches of the entire state. Customary use rights were again upheld by the Oregon Supreme Court in 1993 in Stevens versus City of Cannon Beach. And in 1994, the US Supreme Court denied review of that case, deferring to the state on this matter of property law. Public prescriptive rights, which may provide a public right of use, but not ownership of property may also be created under specific circumstances. A party seeking to establish a prescriptive easement must show by clear and convincing evidence the open or notorious use of property that's adverse to the rights of the owner for a continuous and uninterrupted period of 10 years. And adversity generally means that it's without the owner's permission. Public prescriptive rights can be important, as we'll see here shortly, for providing perpendicular access to the beach. There are other means for public rights, including um, express and implied dedication even if property is privately owned. So in Oregon, you may have heard about Surfrider's lawsuit to restore access to Lighthouse Beach. And I understand that Sam or Carmen will be presenting about this campaign here today. So I'll just note that here we're seeking to have the court declare that the public's past use of a trail to access the beach has given rise to a public prescriptive easement. And you can learn more at our Legal Coastal blog um, and the websites here on this slide. Next, Washington beach access. Washington also has strong beach access law. The public generally has access to the wet sand below the ordinary high tide line for all tide lands within the state, including in the Salish Sea, the Puget Sound, and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The Washington Seashore Conservation Act, which codifies the public trust doctrine, protects access to the state's ocean beaches below the ordinary high tide line. And under the state's public trust doctrine, the public may access trust property for navigation, fishing, and other incidental activities, even when it's privately owned. However, no Washington court has ruled whether walking on the beach or wading in the water on privately owned beaches, stream banks, and tidelands is a right under the public trust doctrine, although Surfrider would argue that they certainly are. Finally, we're keeping an eye on a case called Friends of Guimes Island versus Kevin Duncan, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, that raises custom and the scope of public trust rights and whether that includes the right to walk along private beach property. The trial court seemed to get it wrong in a decision earlier this March, as did an appellate commissioner upon a request for review, but a trial will continue on whether past use gives rise to customary rights. One example of a Washington beach access campaign is at Cherry Point, where earlier this year, Whatcom County granted an industrial private property owner's request to close a road that provided vehicular access, or excuse me, to close a road to vehicular access um, to get to um, Cherry Point Beach. Following public outcry, the county actually required the road be reopened, but in case they attempt to close it again, Surfriders Northwest Straits chapter requested that the legal department 
um, assist in analyzing public rights for this beach. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this and other questions surrounding beach access rights at specific properties are incredibly fact-based and depend on a lot of circumstances. But as an example of how we can provide support, here we prepared a four-page memo, a four-page one-pager summarizing the public's rights under the public trust doctrine, um, the relevant aquatic reserve management plan, and related laws, and the county's shoreline master plan. Um, and the intent was that Surfrider could share this with the county to educate them about why the road and the access to Cherry Point must remain open. So this has been a very brief general summary on beach access. It's a very complex area with a lot of nuance. So if you have any particular questions, any specific questions come up, please don't hesitate to reach out to the legal department. And I hope you have a great rest of your chapter conference. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Carmen Matthews. Uh, and I'm the two uh, chapters um, point person for legal counsel uh, on the Free Lighthouse Beach campaign. Uh, Lighthouse Beach is a very important uh, site and a coastal gem for us, um, not because it's the best surf spot in the world, but because it's where everybody goes to learn surf. It's a place where people bring their families and it's not an over uh, popular or uh, populated beach. It's, uh, it's been a place where I learned to surf. Most of the people who I know learned to surf there and a treasure for our area and for everybody who visits the Orca.
anxiety or ego anxiety of what you're doing and what you're doing for the right reasons. So, um, you know, for the like, yeah. Yeah. Hello, can you all hear me? Okay, cool. I can't hear anyone there. So thank you, Mara. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to keep my camera on. My internet's really dodgy. There's construction in my neighborhood. So if I go off my camera, I apologize for that. I hope you are all having an awesome, um, yeah, actually, can, can you guys hear me in the room? Mara's not sure if you guys can hear me. Can like you put your hands up or something if you can hear me? Okay, tell me when you want me to talk. How about now? Can you hear me now? Awesome. Everyone in the room as well? Cool. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, my name's Stephanie Seekich Quinn. I am the senior manager of our Coast and Climate Initiative. I wish that I could be there today. I love the Pacific Northwest. I used to live in Seattle for several years. And so I feel like I'm at home with you all at heart, at least. So we're gonna talk a bit about what we're doing at the national level and Pacific Northwest with coast and climate. Next slide. So I'm sure you've seen this before. I actually keep it in every single year on purpose because if there's two things we need to know about how climate change is impacting our ocean and coast is to remember these two statistics. As you know, we have global warming, we've been pumping greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, it's acting like a blanket, it's trapping tons and tons of heat in both the atmosphere and the ocean has absorbed 90% um, of the, the heat that's been put out into the atmosphere. So the ocean is just really, really, really on fire technically. Um, the amount of energy that is in the amount of energy that is equivalent to that 90% of heat that's been trapped into the ocean is equivalent to four Hiroshima bombs going off every two seconds, just to give you an idea of that. And then of course, the ocean is like a sponge, it's absorbing about 30% of the carbon that's been emitted into the air. So you can look at the graphic here, Surfrider put it together, we can kind of start from the bottom and go all the way up. It's really self-explanatory. I mean, our ocean and coasts are at the center of climate change. Um, we have our warming oceans, which is causing sea level rise. Half a quarter of the sea level rise is coming from the heat that's in the ocean through thermodynamics. It means that the water molecules expand as it gets hotter. So we're also seeing with, um, sorry, I'm just reading the, the chats. Um, and uh, we have ocean acidification, which is changing the chemistry. We are now seeing shrinking beaches, as we've mentioned before. And then that's just through our lens of Surfrider, but there's a ton of other stuff that are going on. And I actually, I took out all the slides that show climate change impacts because like at this point, it's so obvious, right? Like years and years ago, when we started working on climate, I had to like show permafrost melting and like seas rising. And now it's just like every day you turn around and there's climate change. So next slide. So what's at risk? Obviously, it's everything that's close to us, including our ecosystems, our public transit, our infrastructure, national security. There's multiple um, Navy camps on both seaboards that are basically going to be drowning. Um, on the East Coast, there is Hamptons Road, and they are already planning on how to relocate that entire base there. Um, and of course, mental health. And I was really happy to see that you all have someone coming to talk about climate anxiety and what that feels like. Because, I mean, the kids these days, that's what they're saying they're most nervous about. So we can't overlook the kind of heart, mind, and body connection to this as well. Next slide. Next slide. 
And briefly, we all know these initiatives, we've gone through all of them. I'm happy to be the last one since you kind of got like a preview into all of this, but climate is connected to every single one of our initiatives. I mean, Jen can, you know, talk at nauseum of how much greenhouse gas intensive the plastic industry is from the whole entire life cycle from making it until it goes to the grave and burning goes back in the atmosphere it's just atrocious pete as pete mentioned earlier it's connected to offshore oil drilling oil spills etc beach access again we've talked about that and this will change to coast and climate instead of coastal preservation but you know it, it's not just trashing our you know these high impact weather events it's not just impacting our coastlines it's again that kind of community and our and our you know neighbors um and then of course we see with clean water as as our atmosphere is warming it's going to bring and trap more precipitation so we're going to see more rain as our climate changes and we've all seen that it's pretty crazy the rain events we're getting um next slide so we have a strategic plan. I'm sure you've like heard about it a lot. It's very exciting to us that have worked on it. And we wanted to kind of pare down four simple lenses to look through for coast and climate. So the first one is the easiest and there's so many different ways to do it. We have an activist toolkit. I have about two pages of information and examples of what you can do if you want to get involved more, whether it's sending people to marches, whether it's just having a brochure at your table, whether you do a community forum where you have an expert come and talk, it's the easiest on-ramp, although I hate that word, sorry, I try not to say it again. Um, it's the easiest way to really get yourself involved with the coast and climate with your chapter. Um, we work a lot, and Gus is gonna talk about this in a second, with communities on how to plan for sea level rise and how to improve their coastal management practices. Um, we're obviously doing a lot of um, nature-based solutions. We don't do them as much on the West Coast. We're going to start doing that, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but there's another great effort that we're trying to really blow up is blue carbon efforts. So that's mangroves, you know, salt marshes. Uh, it, they have the power to trap more carbon than trees on land. So we're going to really start blowing up that um, kind of programs where we have right now. We have something going on in, in Puerto Rico right now where our employee there just decided he was just going to go. Puerto Rico is a little different. You probably have to get permits there, but he's just planting mangroves um, because he knows it works. And so we're, we're really going to start blowing up that program as well. And then finally, and I think where a lot of our work is coming and we've really exploded our work in the past couple of years is at the federal level, which I'll talk about in a little bit to ensure that we're enacting strong laws and policies or fighting bad laws and policies. Next slide. Hey Gus, you want to take it away? But I want to just give a little snippet on sea level rise. Sea level rise. Thank you. Uh, just highlighting sea level rise work and our vulnerability in Washington State. Uh, sea level rise. In the United States, coastal zone, about 40% of the population resides basically from beach to the watersheds. Significant inflation that was out there along our 3,026 miles of tidally influenced coastline. We stop and think about that. That's actually all the way from here to Washington, D.C., within one state. So, significant vulnerability to our communities and our people, especially some of the vulnerable communities on the Washington coast, tribes that have been there since time immemorial. In many, many years, got a lot of the really key language in that, and the in 2016 with the big changeover, uh, and and uh, Kevin Fisher and Grace Harbor and Stacey came in at the last minute to run power behind the scenes and strip all that really good language out. That was a huge wake up call to us that we needed to be stronger and that we needed to actually pass a statewide policy that requires us. Utilize this best available plan in their planning efforts. 
So we've been uh, working on that with staff through the State of the Beach report, calling on this, this need. Uh, we made a really significant run at this last year through House Bill 1099, uh, Washington State campaign with our partners. Unfortunately, And one of Governor James' priority legislation piece this year. So uh, we're going to get it done. It's just a matter of time. It's going to be a pretty successful group. So that will pass it off to Charlie. Sure. And I'll try to be brief here. I, I recognize that we're over our time, and I'm pushing up against uh, that buffet of food over there. So um, I'm actually, you know, I'll talk quickly about these statewide planning goals and how they relate to the work we do here in Oregon, because that's really the foundation of where coast and climate and our issues sort of come together. That's the big intersection. Um, goal 16, 17, 18, and 19 um, are great statewide planning goals that will direct and balance the protection of our beaches and our coastal resources with that of the needs of people and development. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, these are pretty strong statewide guidance that protect things like our beaches and our estuaries and seagrass beds. Um, the problem is, is that there's always little opportunities to crack those statewide land use plans and they're actually implemented at the local level. So they're really just guidance for our local governments to act and create and plan their laws. So they have to be as conservative as those, but they can kind of twist the lines a little bit, particularly to help with different community needs. Um, and that's one of the biggest challenges that we see in Oregon. Goal 18 is the one I'll talk about quickly. Uh, beaches and dunes, and it pretty much limits the amount of opportunities for shoreline armoring. And as you guys probably all know, that's something that we are heavily opposed to. Uh, roads are beaches um, and exacerbates erosion problems. Um, so goal 18 pretty much says you can't do that on the coast of Oregon, if you have a piece of property that was developed um, after 1972. Now, the word developed, and it starts to twist and twist all through, and then they can create sort of goal 18 exceptions. Well, we're going to let a little exception happen, and um, that's probably some of the biggest things we're seeing on the Oregon coast right now. We have a lot of open beaches, but we're seeing the slow erosion of one exception at a time of allowing armory. And this is what it looks like over time. Um, that's a campaign that we worked on up in Dunedin where um, some illegal riprap and shoreline armoring was put in place many, many years ago. Uh, it eroded away and fell onto the public beach. And then guess whose problem that is? That's our, our problem at that point in time. It's off of their property. Um, so we have to seek litigation actions or actions from the state to reprimand. This uh, prevents shoreline armoring uh, in Tillamook County. That's an example of where a county allowed for an exception, where they said, you know what, we're going to let you guys, even though these properties weren't technically developed, we're going to let you armor them. And that's what happened right down here. You can see before, it's a nice forehead, and it's like that, beautiful wide open beach. Hi there, I don't know. If you can hear me, I'm gonna assume you can. We can hear on the Zoom call. But we just okay. can't hear them. This sort of happened to us earlier too. Okay, cool. 
Um, I only have like a couple more slides. I don't know if we're gonna watch a video, but I know you guys wanna go to lunch. Okay, so just we're going to kind of bring it out back to the national level. We publish a report every year where we grade states on how they're managing their coastlines and responding to sea level rise. And the Pacific Northwest is doing awesome. Actually, the entire West Coast is doing awesome. Um, there's a report in there for each state, and it's very short. We have recommendations. And again, we'll be putting a toolkit together so that you guys can take these reports and use them at the municipal level, the state level, and at the federal level. Next slide. As I mentioned, the past couple of years, we've really exploded our presence in DC. Uh, this past couple of, many of you have come, it's very exciting for us. Um, we did Hill Day recently, where we met with 150 congressional offices. We had 160 activists and we're elevating climate change as our priority focus when we go to DC. Next slide. It's funny, I can see your screen catch up before my screen catches up. Um, so recently we met with the White House. This was great. Gina McCarthy, she's the national climate czar. We just thought it was going to be her. And then she had all these amazing people show up, like David Hayes has helped write some of our bedrock environmental laws and policies. Dr. Spinnard is the undersecretary of NOAA. Um, they were just so enamored with our work because, again, most people are really connecting all of the impacts to the ocean and coast through climate. So it's some kind of a breath of fresh air when they met with us. Next slide. And yes, this is great news, but I have to put a caveat in here. There's a lot going on in any given day. We're watching a half a dozen bills at the federal level. As you all know, Biden finally signed the Inflation Reduction Act. It really gives a lot of money to climate action for coast and ocean, which is great. It's not perfect. Uh, obviously, I think it's really important to, to put that in there. There There is an exception for drilling. Um, and so because it's not perfect, we really want to keep on the administration so that he can use all of his executive powers before he's out of office. So please go to our website and take action and send it out to your to your um, social networks. We really do want to make sure Biden um, is, is putting his money where his mouth is saying he's going to be the climate president. Um, and there's quite a few things he can do under executive orders still, including banning offshore oil drilling. Next slide. And then this is a piece of legislation we have a toolkit for. I'm not going to go into it too much, but this is kind of a cleanup bill um, from the Inflation Reduction Act, where if we can get a lot of these things passed, again, offshore oil drilling, making sure we're doing renewable energy in a safe way. So while we have this great invest investment of $370 billion from that act, there's so much more to do. So again, go to our website. We have an action alert for this bill as well. Next slide. And finally, this is, I want to end on a, a really positive note. As I was mentioning, um, Hector, he's our employee in Puerto Rico. Um, that's him literally just, you know, propagating his mangroves. <laughs> he's amazing. Uh, lots of dune restoration on the East Coast. Um, we're actually hiring a, a new person to help build out this program. So we're going to be doing a lot of nature-based solutions. Charlie can talk about some of the stuff that he's worked on in Oregon up there to give you kind of an idea of what that would look like in the Pacific Northwest. It looks different everywhere around the country, but it really is just so important with this, the climate crisis that people feel uplifted and they have a way to do that. And so this is going to give people an avenue to, whether it's just going and weeding you know, invasive species from a dune. That's helpful. That's keeping that dune healthy. So stay tuned. We're really stoked to build out this program and we'll be having resources and staff um, meet with all the chapters so that we'll find ways for every quadrant of the country to get involved. And have an awesome lunch. I'm sorry I kept it to you. Um, and have fun, y'all. <laughs>